We begin with hymn number 43, hymn 43. found on page 15. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, it will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy eternal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Please turn 
to Psalm 34. We read together the first ten verses of Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Glory be to the Father. Your spirit in the inner man, 
that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, that so, being rooted and grounded in love, we may be able to understand with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson is found in the book of Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, beginning with verse 39. There are some strong words here, but it reveals God's both sides, if you will. Moses writes, but it's the Lord speaking through Moses, and he says, See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death, and I bring to life. I have wounded, and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my hand. I lift my hand to heaven and declare, as surely as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he avenged the blood of his servants he will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our sermon hymn today is 10 verses long, and I decided to break it up. So please turn to hymn 387, and we will sing the first three verses at this time. Hymn 387, verses 1 through 3.
epistle lesson is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the third chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the epistle lesson. We continue with him 387 verses 4 and 5. <laughs> seventh chapter of St. Luke, beginning with the eleventh verse. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Here ends the gospel. <laughs> continue with him 387 verses 6 through 8 verses 6 through 8 
confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 22. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scripture and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We conclude hymn 387, verses 9 and 10. God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from the book of Proverbs, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold, what I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began. When there were no oceans, I was given birth. 
when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or its fields or any of the dust of the world, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so that the waters would not overstep his command, and when I marked out the foundations of the earth. Rather, I remember when he marked out the foundations of the earth. I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in this whole world and delighting in mankind. This is our text. Dear fellow reading, our text is from the book of Proverbs, a book which is part of what is known as wisdom literature. Job and Ecclesiastes are included in that list as well. The book of Proverbs is like the Sermon on the Mount, but in the Old Testament. Both the Sermon on the Mount and the book of Proverbs teach the kind of wisdom that flows out of love the kind of selfless love that Christ demonstrated for you and me and the whole world. The book of Proverbs is written as poetry. And Hebrew poetry is not like English poetry, which often involves meter and rhyme. Our hymns are good examples of English poetry. Hebrew poetry puts two lines of thought side by side. The relationship between the two lines can be repetition, it can be opposite or contrast, or it can be a way of building. When the second line repeats a thought of the first line, it helps to better explain that thought. When the second line is the opposite, the contrast helps to sharpen the thoughts in both lines. And when the second line builds on the first line, then the thought is further developed. This explains most of the poetry, but it doesn't cover every example. Okay, it's not my fault, I'm sorry. To, to, to better understand Hebrew poetry, keep these examples in mind. Poetry is concentrated thought. So, Hebrew poetry is not meant to be consumed in large quantities, but a little at a time. Like medicine, you don't take the whole jar at once, you take a little bit at a time and spread it out. Now, I've mentioned the author of our sermon series a number of different times over the years. And regarding today's text, he might not have kept that thought of a little bit at a time in mind, for our text is... 20 verses. But I did take his suggestion uh, for my theme today. I, wisdom, was appointed from eternity. I highlighted three thoughts. The first one, my fruit, meaning wisdom's fruit, is better than fine gold. Second, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And three, wisdom was the craftsman at creation. The first nine chapters of Proverbs speak of wisdom. I normally think of wisdom as a thing, not a person. But here the thing is the, the counsel of the wise and Solomon speaks of it as a like a person speaking. So wisdom is talking to us even though it's a thing. And wisdom says, my fruit is better than fine gold, what I yield surpasses choice silver. Gold and silver are known as precious metals. Precious points to the value that we give to these metals. You can even invest 
Wisdom says there is something better than gold or silver. And for some people, that would be an arresting thought. It may sound surprising to some people of this world. Accumulating a nest egg for retirement is a high priority for many, many people. I can think of two financial advice shows that are on the radio on a weekly basis. One of them on Sunday morning when I'm driving over here. What gold or silver or money can buy is very important to, to many people. But wisdom says, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. The words fruit and yield point to the benefit that wisdom gives. Wisdom points to the benefits as a way of inviting us then to acquire wisdom. Wisdom says, I walk in the way of righteousness. Wisdom knows what is right and what is wrong. And God, and through his word, has revealed to us wisdom. What is right and what is wrong. Wisdom speaking as a person says that she walks in the way that is right. Doing what is right is better than gold and silver, wisdom said. Some people think cutting corners and a little cheating in a business deal is a way of getting ahead in this world. But no matter what form the stealing takes, it is still not walking in the way of righteousness. Wisdom says, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses twice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. When we do what God wants us to do, wisdom promises that our daily bread will be supplied as well. And daily bread includes everything that we need, not just food and clothing and a roof over our heads. Good government, for example, is also part of our daily bread. As we look at the benefits of wisdom, certainly the knowledge that wisdom supplies stands out. And that knowledge includes knowing what is evil. And Solomon writes here, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. We have ample reason to fear the Lord. Our Old Testament, in very strong words, sets forth God's vengeance on the wicked. And as we look at words like that, it should give us terror. But at the same time, the word respect is also part of that word fear. We respect God for the atonement of sinners for the love and compassion shown by Jesus to the widow of Nan in our gospel lesson, for example. To love what God loves also means then to hate evil. Wisdom is revealed to us by God's word. See the connection, wisdom, God's word. Since wisdom comes from God, wisdom hates whatever God hates. Here we do well to remember that you and I are creatures made by God. God is not something that man created for his personal benefit or need. Rather, God made each and every one of us. That also means then that man, people, you and I do not get to determine what is right and what is wrong or what is evil or what is bad. The Lord is supreme. There is no one above him. He has the first word and the last word and everything in between. Some people have chosen to deny that the Lord is supreme or even deny that he exists. Such denial is plain and simple unbelief. 
And just because someone does not want something to be true does not make that something untrue. Note how the verse reads. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil speech and perverse speech. After the mention of evil, the first two things are mentioned are pride and arrogance. And they help us to define what wisdom has in mind by the word evil. Pride is dangerous because pride in includes the idea of being self-sufficient. There's a place for some of that. But when self be becomes the focus of our attention, the complete focus of our attention, the need for God is pushed off to the side. And that pride then often leads to cutting off from God entirely. To be cut off from Christ and his forgiveness of sins means that eternity will be spent not in heaven. Evil includes perverse speech. An example of perverse speech is to speak in such a way that people think one thing but your heart on the inside has got a whole different picture altogether. It is possible to hide our thoughts from other people or from each other. But God isn't fooled by what we say. Wisdom promises wonderful benefits. Wisdom says, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. And... So, what do we do? Do we say all the right words so that other people think that we think highly of God and, and, and uh, if we're in God's house regularly that somehow or other speaking the right way and, and being in God's house is somehow going to turn God to give us some sort of a blessing? We shouldn't think that we can put on a veneer and hide what's in our heart from God. God cannot be manipulated to give us prosperity. But we don't need to fool God. We do well to hate evil and pursue what is good. And then simply to enjoy the blessings of the fruit of wisdom. There are joys and blessings that God gives that no amount of gold and silver can buy. I'm sure I've told this story before. During my first call, there was a couple that was married and they waited five years before God finally blessed them with their first child. The parents shared their joy with me, the joy of having a child finally. And I didn't do a thing to deserve that joy. Now that's a joy I received 38 or more years ago and it's a joy that I still enjoy today. The fact that I could be there with those parents and see their newborn child. Wisdom says, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. <coughs> I've already said Solomon has wisdom speaking as if it were a person. And now in the second half of our text, Solomon does even more with, with uh, uh, wisdom. Now Solomon says wisdom is a real person, not just a thing that's being spoken of like a person. That wisdom is a person is clearly seen when Solomon writes, then I, I refers to wisdom, then I was the craftsman at God's side, at his side. A craftsman is someone that does things, it's a person, not a thing. 
And Solomon also says of this person, I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began. This person existed from eternity, existed before there was such a thing as time. Note how this person named Wisdom speaks. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. When there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or its fields, or any of the dust of the world. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so that the waters would not overstep his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was the craftsman at his side, and I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, Rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. We can note from these words, first of all, that wisdom, the person, is a different person than the Lord himself. We can note also that the words here in Proverbs are say, saying that wisdom was active in creation. And I'm sure you can already see where I am leading in this thought. We are speaking of God, three persons, yet one God. We speak of Christ as begotten of the Father from eternity. As we look at the beginning of John's Gospel, we read in these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The word that revealed wisdom was there in the beginning. In Colossians, Paul writes, He, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then uh, in Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians, we read, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. I think it's pretty clear, at least it is to me, that here in this portion of Proverbs, Christ is speaking to us in the person named Wisdom. As Son of God, Jesus is from eternity. As Son of God, Jesus was the craftsman of creation. And as the Son of God, Jesus is the craftsman of our salvation. Wisdom, God's wisdom, is revealed by Christ crucified and risen again. Certainly the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation are great benefits from wisdom. And certainly such benefits are better than gold and silver. And just to try and understand that this wisdom is from eternity, existed before there was such a thing as time, that very thought is mind-boggling. 
No wonder Solomon invites us to receive wisdom. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all our understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Again, we have enjoyed the privilege of gathering in this house of worship to hear your holy and precious word. May its message of salvation through Christ stir up in our hearts faith and love and produce the full fruits of good works in our lives. May we not forget your word which we have heard or bring shame upon it by our lips speaking against it, our hearts not believing it, or our lives not obeying it. Through the Spirit, open the scriptures more and more to our understanding that we might know you better, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Father, we greatly need the comfort your word brings us. We are by nature sinful, and our flesh is continually opposed to your will. We often find that we act against your commandments, doing the very things you forbid and neglecting the things that you command. We justly deserve eternal separation from you in hell, but we plead your love and mercy, which is revealed to this world of sinners in your word. Let the blood of Christ, your Son, blot out our sins from your memory and present us faultless before you. Our only plea is that you forgive us for his sake. There is nothing that we desire more than eternal life through his merits and mediation. Father, from your word we know that your heavenly throne is a throne of grace and that Jesus, our Savior, intercedes for us there. To it we come burdened with our worries, cares, and needs, our sorrows, troubles, and illnesses. 
Hold us to your bosom and by your counsel and aid relieve us of our many burdens according to your will. We know you are a God so gracious and merciful, so near us when we pray and so quick to respond to our pleas. Why then should we be fearful, anxious about our future? O oh, Father, according to your own promise, bless us now and always for Jesus' sake, in whose name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with hymn 390. scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is 577. 577. 